they had sent me up to Studio 54 one night to photograph um, some event that was going on up there, some kind of like a dinner. I wasn't really aware of like the disco scene. I didn't really know. I mean, I knew it existed, but I wasn't, I hadn't been to Studio 54 or Xenon or any of those places. After the event was over and all the kind of like the, the party guests left, all the regulars came in, transvestites, the decked out people and the people with glitter on their faces. The whole atmosphere of the place completely changed from like a sort of dinner party event to this regular nightly scene at Studio 54. They changed the whole lighting scheme of the place. You know, the disco ball dropped down and this like moon with a Coke spoon dropped down, which was like a sort of a centerpiece at Studio 54. And I wasn't really interested in getting like shots of um, Andy Warhol and Bianca Jagger and, you know, Halston and, and all those people. I wasn't really interested in doing the paparazzi stuff. I was fascinated visually by what I was seeing. I mean, it was like, um, you know, it was a bit of like a train wreck, you know, it was like, I, I, I couldn't help but, but look at it. Nobody was afraid of the camera. They loved being photographed. I just saw like this whole world going on there, this world of like posers, and every time I turned around, I saw a photograph. It was just a drama, one drama after another. Really a case of the people watching the people who are watching the people who are watching the people. It was three legs, which covered the United States, Mexico, Japan, up and down Europe, the Colosseum in Rome, Red Square in Russia. It was a long tour. It had a lot of firsts in it. The Red Square show was a first. He also went up to St. Petersburg to receive an honorary award. We put all of these experiences together, created the book, Each One Believing, then the book turned into the show, the traveling photo show. Paul had never been in Moscow before. Paul had never been in Russia before. And yet he wrote back in the USSR when he was in his early 20s in England and had this fantasy of what the USSR was like, was finally there and finally going to perform that song in Red Square. It was a great night for him. Putin was in the audience. Gorbachev came backstage before the show and met Paul. I was in the room when that happened and you know they, they both embraced each other and they were talking in different languages but through a translator but they were both so charming. They're both very charming people and it was amazing to see the two of them, these two icons. There was a lot of warmth between them. It was a really nice exchange and I think Paul was pretty deeply moved by it. He actually said to a few of us that were in the, 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 the dressing room that, that day and he just kind of turned to us and he said, you know, it's amazing that I'm here. If I, if I had told my father when I was a kid that I would, one day I was going to be performing in Red Square in front of the president, he wouldn't believe me. He'd say, oh, come on, you're crazy. Get out of here. He was genuinely just overwhelmed, I think, by, by the moment, you know, and the magnitude of it, you know, which was really nice to see. Phyllis and, and uh, Rusty I've been traveling with for the last you know four years. Patty came on this year and was an instant friend. And uh, you know you make very quick connections on the road because you're with each other all the time. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Airplane. You know it's like you love them or you hate them. Doesn't matter. You know you're you're stuck with them. You know. So some people you could just become very bonded with and very close with. And Rusty and I have been around the world. I've been working with Paul about five years and. Uh, I guess we've been touring about four years, and uh, it's been such a kick working with Bill. We, you know, good buddies on the road. We hang out, and, you know, occasionally and get go out for drinks or whatever. And he's just 
a, a fantastic guy, real soulful, and uh, obviously a great photographer too. In rehearsals down in Miami, that's where I first met Bill, and I took an immediate liking to him. What's not to like? He's a, a very a very genuine person, number one. That's the thing that I think I like the most. Um, and obviously an outstanding photographer. And as I spent time on the road, um, he's one of those people who, um, when you're around Bill, you feel... Um, he, for me, he makes me relax. Tours can be quite tense, quite difficult. There's a lot of things going on that can make life uh, confusing, if you like. And I was a new boy, and he was one of those people who made me feel comfortable Im immediately. So it's, it's also such a trip, you know, working on a tour where it's, you know, it's nice, everything's together and the, the, the backgrounds are nice and, you know, A1 photographer and, you know, just the, the whole thing, obviously Paul too, but just the way that, that there's, they call it the bubble. We call it the bubble. And it's like when you're in the bubble, everything's taken care of and, you know, you're, everything's moving and it's just a lot of action and, and, uh, and then you leave the bubble at the end of the tour, and it's and it's kind of scary sometimes. You have to go through it like a, a debriefing process, you know, or quarantine. You really, I mean, truly, I, I, it sounds funny, but you really, you know, I'll, you ask any touring musician, you know, coming off the road, uh, there's always a point at which you have to, you know, really kind of be away from people if you're smart because um, it's just a strange integration, reintegration process. It's like, you know, you get depressed or, you know. I shouldn't project. I get depressed, but I think everyone sort of goes through the same thing. I don't have a big ego to begin with. Um, I'm not one of those people that walks into a room full of people and everyone stops and goes. <gasps> Between 12th and 13th Street, I'll oh. send you there and I found a joint that is so good. Oh yeah, best potato pancakes since my grandma. Yeah. What's it called? Little Pole. You have a soca? You have a soca? That's right. She was such the guy. That's the guy. A fairly quiet guy. I'm not a pushy person. I like to I like to observe and I like to see what people are doing. I, I'm, a, I'm a voyeur, basically. My father had um, some issues with alcohol and medications, and um, you know there were times when you know his behavior was a little bit erratic and. So my family, my sister and my mother and I would, would pretty much have to read, you know, where he was at that time to see, you know, how best to react around that. I think at a very early age, I honed my skills reading p people, reading their vibe. And I think I use that skill today. You know, when you're working with somebody like McCartney, there's a lot of signals and cues. I read these signals. I don't know if I'm always right. I think most of the time I am. Oh, <laughs> you don't know the half of it. <laughs>